Attention projectionist. This chart will help you make sure that your picture will be focused properly before the show starts. Adjust the lens Now adjust the sound volume. That's all. Everything will be properly set for your show to begin. Hello and welcome to Vital Indie Media. I'm Lou Ojeda, and I am here with my guest, Jason Paul Collum. He is a writer and director of horror films and uh, has a horror film that I want to talk to him about that has a relevance right now as we're uh, filming during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. A uh, film called you see here a film called Safe Inside, and uh, in little in little uh, print here, just underneath it says, "Or is he Safe Inside? Or is he?" Uh, it was just made uh, a few years ago, and um, welcome, Jason Paul Collum. Hello, thank you for having me on. You're very welcome. Thank you. Um, for those of uh, the, for those viewers out there who don't know who you are, um, you've been making films and especially horror films for twenty five years. Is it twenty five years this year? Yeah, twenty five like for twenty five years. 25 years. Uh, so do you want to give a, a quick rundown of your? Um, of your career with uh, 25 years of horror? Um, well, prior to the 25 years, when I was in high school, I started making short films for with friends. Uh, we built 10 minute things on camcorders. And around the time I got into college, I decided I was going to write a full length feature, one of my favorite films that I felt deserved a sequel was Last House of Black. And I wrote the script uh, just as a spec script and I sent it off to the people who owned it. They had been hot on it for about six months, loved it, but decided ultimately they couldn't make it because it was going to be an NC-17. It was a very sexually violent um, script and, and, and make it even more <clears throat> controversial, I guess we'll say, was that the torture wasn't happening to a woman, which was, would typically be the case in a horror film, but it was happening to a young man. And they just felt that they couldn't make the film only based on uh, NC-17 was considered like a death immediately at the box office because most series wouldn't even pick it up so i took a script and i sent it off to a company in virginia called more more video mpm production and they loved it but couldn't afford the rights however they offered me a chance to make another sequel to a series that they had just obtained which was called mark of the devil and i had no idea how many parts there were in neither did they <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and through my own research, I discovered that there had been five previous chapters, all of them unrelated to each other. And so I made Mark of the Devil 666. That was my first movie. And it was released in July of 1995. And that was on wonderful VHS. On VHS. And um, through a very indie company. But, you know, we made it like $400. It was super cheap. And... Um, uh, that led me to make two more movies for them, which was Five Dark Souls 1 and 2. I decided to, I wanted to expand and get into like bigger movies, you know, B movies, but bigger movies with budgets. And so I made a short film uh, called Julia Wept in 2000. And it did really well and it kind of caught fire um, really beyond what I thought it would. It went to conventions and the lead actress was Brink Stevens, who was a screen queen. And so her fans started picking it up and it got into the right hands. And that person was J.R. Walter. Um, he sat on it for a couple of years. In the meantime, I went to work for a man named David Dakota, who was a B-movie maestro, which would shoot whole entire movies in about four or five days. So he was known for Nightmare Sisters and Sorority Days and the Flying Hall of Rama and Puppet Master 3. And um, he kind of taught me how to make movies quick on a 
uh, on the cheap, but make them look good. And so because of him, I carried those lessons with me um, so that a couple of years later, Jared Bookwalter had discovered Julia Webb and um, offered me a chance to make my first uh, documentary, which was something to scream about. And that's the movie that sent me on my path to being, uh, I don't want to say well, it's, I'm not well known, but a known um, horror film director. Um, it was uh, something to scream about, aired on Showtime for many years, did very well. We had a premiere in West Hollywood at the Virgin Megastore with a cast, and uh, it was the biggest showing that they had of 2004. Oh, nice. So um, that led to, the success of that led to um, my film October Moon, which was one of the very first gay themed horror films, and which the success of that led to part two. And then I just kind of made movies from that point on. So, um, and- I did- Oh, I was going to say, and October Moon came out at this, <laughs> in the same year. There were two gay-themed horror films mm-hmm. that year, and yours was one of them. I uh, was technically the second one. We were the first into production, but we were, we were beached to the theaters by three weeks by Hellbent. Oh, okay, so, right. <laughs> so, so Hellbent technically holds the honor of being the first gay horror film was released in the public. But we came out, we were in production before they were, but we came out three weeks after they were. Over the years, you've been able to um, have your troop, your own troop of actors, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. There's a, a troop of actors who've come back and, and uh, um, did performances for you. Um, and some of them appear in uh, Safe Inside, is that correct? Actually, the, all of them. Everybody who appears in Safe and Side minus one character is portrayed by people who've been in all of my other films. Going back to Mark of the Devil, 666. So oh. it was just, <laughs> I, I call it my reunion movie because um, it was made up of cast who went to college with me in high school, actually. Karen DeLue, um, who starred in Mark of the Devil and plays George Ann in Safe and Side, was actually in my very first student movie for Problem back in high school. So. Um, so it was a mixture of high school friends, college friends who've gone into professional careers and acting, like Christopher Herder, who is the lead in Safe and Side. He's now been on Grimm and The Librarians and um, did a bunch of movies for like Us Van Sant and um, uh, extra, uh, Extraordinary Measures with um, Harrison Ford. And so he's, you know, a professional actor and stage actor. And then it also incorporates Judith O'Day, who was Barbara and Night of the and Frank Stevens. So yeah, a lot of, I tend to use the same people over and over. Harrison Vanderhoff, Tina Fox Dallas. Quick rundown of the, uh, the plot of uh, Safe Inside, without giving too much. But basically, um, I believe it is uh, Chris Harder plays the son of, of a B-movie queen who had died uh, two weeks before, and he's uh, kind of flipping out. Um, <laughs> he's uh, under under a lot of stress and um, and agoraphobic, um, and so that uh, that plays into the idea. Uh, if, if correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here. Um, of of the um, being trapped in, uh, being trapped in, in your own house. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's a thing that I thought of for, um, for COVID-19 right now, but he has, uh, he has a situation where he's trapped in his house <clears throat> for a weekend. I believe his, um, his, uh, his uh, wife is away. Is it a wife or a girlfriend? It's a wife. So he oh, and his wife right. moved into his, so his mother has passed away. They are they have moved into his into her house. He did not grow up in this house. She, the mother has only had only owned this house for a short time. And so they've moved in, the wife there very begrudgingly. Um, and he's kind of recovering from a nervous breakdown. And she is required by her job to leave town for X number of days. And so this is the first time he's going to be alone in the house where his mother has passed away. And as the evening goes on, 
he's already nervous just about being alone. Um, and then like the house creaks and moans and little things seem to move on their own or they're not where he put them when he left the room. And um, so, it's, and then it just kind of intensifies from there. So you're left to wonder, is he having a nervous breakdown again or is there something actually in the house with him? Okay. Um, and with that, what I want to do is um, present to folks the trailer for Safe Inside. So let's um, let's uh, go to it, and and then we'll uh, resume the conversation um, right after. Jason. What I'm telling you, there is something going on inside my house. I am positive. I closed the window and muted the television, and they were both changed when I came back. Is he freaking out that bad? He's totally convinced that something's lurking inside the house trying to kill him. Ah! He thinks his dead mother is appearing to him. JJ? Who are you talking to? She died in that bedroom, JJ. You crack more and more every day. Don't you see him? I think he is a demon. He's come to get me. And Alex thinks that there's some, it's just some squirrel in the attic that came in through a vent and it's making this noise and... Betsy, there is something in my house. You find me. Is he? Yeah. One thing I wanted to mention about um, when I watched Safe Inside is that, um, yes, it is a horror film, but a great deal of it deals with um, uh, a psychological trauma of, of mental illness. And um, and I, I don't want to, um, I, I, uh, uh, the, the feeling that I, you know, that I get from it is that I don't want to scare off anybody by saying that a lot of it is um, dealing, um, uh, do, doesn't, doesn't deal with what a lot of people expect out of horror films, which is an, an enormous amount of blood and gore and things like that, that does show up. Okay, I don't. I, I guess actually, <laughs> right? Okay. Uh, I hope I'm not. I'm not giving away too much no, when not yet. saying that. <laughs> but it 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 isn't that. Um, it isn't that. It isn't there. Um, it just it's not the main focus it does deal with a dramatic situation and i think very well acted by <clears throat> by chris harder um and uh, and some of the others too um you, you have uh, some uh some good actors there with the like bring stevens and and those who've been able to um uh show up time and time again in your movies and do very well. I think you previously told me this was shot in a very, very short period of time. I think like three or four days was five. it? We shot in five, five days. days. And, and okay. then we had a half day of like, um, we had to shoot one final sequence out uh, by the lake. And that was, uh, I don't think it was even a half day. I think we shot for like four hours. So, okay. Yeah, it was a quickie. So I'm, I will pat myself on the back. Um, people, will, people who have a prejudice against low budget indie film um, are gonna say what they're gonna say about it. Um, but for me to have shot, made it look as good as it does in a five day 
shoot. I think the film comes off really well. So um, yeah. it is not for every, it is, how do I say this? It is not for every horror case, but I feel like we've gotten into this mentality with a lot of horror fans that everything, every kind of horror film has to be exactly the same. And when I was growing up, you could be a slasher fan, you could be a ghost movie fan, you could be a vampire fan, you could be into thrillers, you could be into gothic horror, you could be into heavy metal horror, you could be in all these different categories. And I just feel like um, horror today seems to be blood and guts, and that's it. If it doesn't have blood and guts, then it's just it's not a horror. Well, my argument is I grew up with Carrie, 1976 Carrie, being my all time favorite film. And if you look at any movie guide, and Carrie is listed as a horror film, not just a horror film, but a horror classic. If you watch Carrie, Carrie does not become a horror film until the last 20 minutes of the movie. It is a drama, and it has some funny bits, and it has some bits that kind of catch you off guard and startle you. But there is no blood and gore and death and destruction until she gets to the front. And so a lot of my features, the narratives tend to work in that way. I spend a lot of time on character and developing a mood and tell a story about these people's lives. I tend to not tell a story where it show up somewhere and they are the plot. And I felt for a while like I need to apologize for that. Um, and I then I just kind of don't anymore <laughs> because I make the kind of scary movies that I like to see. I don't want to be grossed out. I've always been a kid, teenager, college kid, now adult, um, who enjoyed being scared, not grossed out. So those are the kind of movies that I made. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Um, I, it's, um, if you, if you don't develop characters, if you don't develop a, a true, dramatic situation, <coughs> excuse me, you don't develop a true dramatic situation, then you, you're really missing the point of having um, a very good horror film. And it's a, a lot of the reasons why, um, it, it's a reason why a lot of horror films do not work, um, in my opinion. But, um, but yours does. <laughs> um, oh, yours cool. does, yeah. and uh, and one thing we can one thing we can tell is that if you look in the background of where uh, Jason is, um, it might look a little bit familiar. I believe that uh, most of the most of the film was made in your house. You have a very good eye, sir. Yes, I am actually sitting in the red room, uh, which you see quite often in the side. I made the movie in my own home. And I'm assuming you're alluding to the reason I made the movie here. You, yeah? Oh, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the, basically, my home is a, now 120 years old. It was built in the year 1900 as an old farmhouse and was added on to remodeled, reassembled. Uh, it was a one single family home, then a double family home, then a single family home. Um, it's been remodeled and added onto so many times. It has all these really odd nooks and crannies. And even having been in the home for 15 years now, I still discover things that I didn't realize were ever there. Outlets in the weirdest place, like in closets. Um, I find we pulled up the carpeting and we found a hole in the middle of the dining room floor where they had um, lowered a pool table down into the basement. They, they couldn't put it down the basement stairs. So they just pulled up the floorboards, lowered the pool table down in the basement and covered it up with plywood and carpet. But it's just these weird things. And um, so I thought, well, this house in and of itself is a character, you know? And so that's kind of how the movie itself came to be was what's going on inside this house? You know, especially when you've got characters who don't know the home. You know, again, because the mother character had only been in the home for a year or two, so she wouldn't have noticed everything in the house. And obviously not the son coming to a home that he's never lived in before is going to not know about the house. So is there is there something in the house? Is it the house itself? Is it the mind? We don't know. And 
that's how the book kind of came out. <laughs> it, um, yeah, the house, the house does definitely have um, a character to it, um, very much, very much so. Um, in this particular movie, um, I going going back uh, for to a second, uh, for a second to what you were mentioning about the shooting schedule and um, doing it in five days. Um, I I assume it makes it th does it make it easier or a little bit tougher if it's at your house because because uh, basically. Um, there's there's the idea that you've you've got to do a bit of rearranging or you know doing a, a lot of setup and a, a lot of disruption while you're uh, during those five days. Yes. So basically, what I did was it, it more than disrupted my life; it just disrupted my partner's life. Um, so we moved him into another home for a week. And I invited a bunch of strangers into the, not strangers to me, <laughs> necessarily, but strangers to him. Um, so he was able to kind of go and have something of a quieter life for that week. And um, we almost burned the house down twice. Oh, jeez. Uh, because the electrical is not good in the house. Again, the house is built in 1900, and we have, have a lot of, what they call it, uh, mm -hmm. not, <laughs> not a tube. Am I, am I saying that right? Um, old wiring, well, I'll just put it that way. Um, and we uh, broke a door. <laughs> um, yeah, I had, um, I mean, it was a quick shoot. It was a, I don't want to say, it was really one of the easiest shoots that I've done um, because everybody lived here at the house. Like nobody was going off to motels or anything. You know, it was, you woke up and everybody was already here. I had a, a lighting, the guy who was in charge of lighting and grip they slept out in the backyard. I have a swing in the backyard, and that's where they that's where they slept. And uh, people slept on couches, and I have a couple of guest rooms, and so it kind of became a big couch slumber party, you know. And I'm trying to remember if I had two different rooms there at the same time. I don't think I did. So I think we were able to switch their rooms out. If I remember correctly. One one left, and the other one came in later that same day. Um, but everybody else was here all at the same time. So, yeah, it was um, oh, that's a <clears throat> controlled chaos. We'll call it. Uh, yeah, controlled chaos and also, the thing, you know, uh, some of the things that you learn when you do low-budget filmmaking in a short amount of time is you, you try, and, try and keep things as simplistic as possible as far mm -hmm. as um, you know, as far as uh, shoots go, so um, you know, the, not a whole lot of costume changes. Of course, you have the uh, uh, the most. Uh, uh, I don't want to say uh, for uh, for this, but um, when a when a character is introduced, you know that there's. Um, uh, a lot of work having to be done in order to create mm -hmm. such a character. You know what I'm talking right. about, okay? Yeah. Um, whereas your, whereas say your your lead character is in a t-shirt and shorts and barefoot, like most of the movie, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's the there there's that simplistic thing, you know. You know, as opposed to um, the makeup effects, to the other the, right? The makeup and. It's, Yes. I'm not going to give anything away by, by just saying that the end of the movie gets very um, squishy. I'll say it gets very squishy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and there we do have makeup effects. And, and it's also no secret to give away that you know, his, mother, his mother is in the movie. So, I mean, we see flashbacks to her and she's been dying of cancer. So we see various states of her illness. And he has um, um, delusions of her, we'll say, coming back. And so she's got some rotted skin, which, by the way, was purposeful. But the dress that we bought her, when we turned her into a, a, I don't know if we should say zombie, but in the delusion, she's kind of zombie-esque. 
that's Judith O'Day, who was a star of Night of the Living Dead. So we turned we turned Barbara into a zombie, you know. So that was like a big thing for us. And she's never played a zombie before. So that was that was but well, she thought that, that was kind of cool. Um so anyways, I think what you're kind of getting at is at is in the matter of five days, we were able to have cast members who were wearing two shirts and barefoot, and we've also got characters who are done up in zombie makeup now and or slow death makeup or um, you know the things that make the end of the movie squishy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. You know, so um, so what that requires of me is to, and I kind of do this as a because I'm, I'm also a teacher. You have to be aware of what's going on besides what's directly in front. Of you. you know, so I know that I've got this person needs to be putting makeup on this person. This person is doing the charity and their hair does. This person needs to be. Um, out making sure that dinner is going to be ready for everybody at five o'clock because we're going to take a break at five o'clock. If this person needs to be setting a flight to this person, like I need to know in my head who needs, who needs to be where and when, you know. And I do have a line producer, and in this film it was Amanda Lawrence, and um, who had never done anything like this before, by the way. Um, she was just kind of game for doing it, and she kept the train rolling. So I kind of let her know what needed to be done, and then set her on her way. And she kind of made sure that everything that I couldn't see with my eyes was actually happening you know so it takes it, when you're trying to do something the way that i do it it takes more than just me to do it if that makes sense you know it's oh, yeah. it, it kind of it kind of has to be a well-oiled train for the most part um because you see a lot of people who make movies in, in four or five days and because this is i'm not this again i learned to do it from david dakota who was a master at it um but when I see a lot of people who kind of make these indie films, they forget to do um, enough shots, enough angles, maybe. And we only had one camera, you know? So it's just like, you gotta move, move, move. I inform my actors ahead of time, you get two takes, okay? If you nail that, if you nail your dialogue in two takes, we're moving on. I don't care if you don't think the light was hitting you correct. I don't care if you don't feel like you got the right emotion. Like if I think that you did it right, and you nailed off the line the way you're supposed to with the right amount of emotion that I'm expecting, then we're moving on. And that's and it sounds a little crude to say it that way, but when you're trying to do something quick and rapid fire, that's just how it works, especially because you want to have as many shots, as many different angles as possible to take for your editor to take them. Because otherwise you wind up with these movies where it's like a single sterile shot of two actors talking to each other or having a fight that just looks ridiculous you know um so i guess you just kind of have to pre-plan to um use your friends who are willing to work for next to nothing use your friends who are willing to work for nothing <laughs> you know um know that you're going to owe some people some favors um you know in order to make the best product that you possibly can i think you made um uh, a very fine film I think uh, uh, let's see, called uh, Safe Inside um, by writer director Jason Paul Collum. Um, Jason, what's uh, what's coming up next for you? Well, being oh, so, this is my twenty fifth year in the business, and so I have decided to both make a brand new documentary, which is called Everything. I'm stepping away from the horror genre. Uh, this is called Everything I Need to Know I Learned from the Letter People, which was a reading program for kindergartners that I grew up on. And if you type that title into your YouTube, you will see the investment trailer. When I was seeking investors, we put that up on YouTube. Um, I did find them, and um, it just kind of gives you a very quick idea. Of if you don't know what the letter people were, um, you will learn about them fairly quick. And if you do know what the letter people are, your eyes, I guarantee you, will go because it left an indelible impression on its generation um, for those of us who had it. So again, everything I need to know I learned from the letter people. That's the, that'll be the trailer that you're going to look up on YouTube. Then, also to celebrate my 25th year of business, I decided to re-release every single title that I've done that I own the rights to. So of my 14 oh. films, um, I'm releasing 13 of them over the summer, 
some of them are going to be by themselves, and then all of them are going to be in a box set. In wow, very nice. <laughs> so um, first up will be Mark of the Devil, 666, and Sacred Pride. Those will be re-released in July, on, on July 7th, um, which was the original release date for Mark of the Devil 666 back in 1991. So that was very specifically chosen. Um, then in August, we put back out, I believe, um, Screaming in High Heels, which was a documentary that I made about uh, Linnea Quigley, Briggs Stevens, and Michelle Bauer, who were the original Scream Queens from the 80s. And I'm not talking to Jamie Lee Curtis Scream Queens or the Faye Ray Scream Queens. I'm talking about the girls that got naked and died horribly in um, kind of schlocky movies back in the 80s mm-hmm. and <clears throat> created, created their own phenomenon um, by creating what they unintentionally did and ran with it. Um, and that one ran up, and we sold it to NBC. So that one aired on Chiller and Sci-Fi for many years, and now it's going to be back on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, and then in, in September, very early September, we'll be putting out the box set of 13 of my 14 movies. And um, on the 15th anniversary Blu-ray of um, October Moon, 1 and 2. So that's kind of what this year and actually the next couple of months. So if you guys see this, please support an independent filmmaker because I got to pay back. <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely support your independent filmmakers wherever they are for sure. And um, uh, Safe Inside, I believe right now you said is on Amazon Prime. Yes, so you can get it on Amazon Prime for free. You can watch it. Uh, we had a snafu. It was being distributed by Tempe Entertainment. They went out of business a year and a half ago. And through, apparently it's through multiple people's misunderstanding, it was supposed to roll over, back over to me, but stay in production through, its, um, through, through the company that's putting it out. And they forgot or did not understand to do that or something along the lines. So it's gone for a year and a half um, with no purchases. So that is why it is being re-released officially um, on July 7th of this year. Oh, yeah, July 7th, 2020. So, oh. new box art. It's going to be the same movie that was released a couple of years ago, but it will have brand new art. So, uh, fans, if they're into the DVDs or the Blu-rays, they can go and get it there. But like I said, if you have Amazon Prime, you can go and watch it right now. And please give it some good grades. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. IMDb and give it some good grades. So, yeah, give it to give it some uh, give it some good stars up there. I, I think they have a star system, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Under, all I ask people to do is understand. You know what? We shot it for fourteen thousand dollars in five days. So <laughs> look at it, look at it through that lens, and I hope that you'll you'll appreciate what we can do um, in that short amount of time for a little bit. Of time. So. Yeah, and and um, it's it's something that I bring up a lot of times in my uh, podcasts. Uh, and talking with others is that um, you can still find very, very interesting things done on low budget, sometimes much more interesting than what you'll see in the uh, suburban boxes and, you know, being uh, uh, $500 million being spent on um, garbage, um, yeah. you know, stuff that because is a lot of times not very happen. interesting. Yeah, indies don't have to follow the rules, and that's why they don't like them. <laughs> you know, yeah, your yeah. Most, if you look back over horror history, Texas Chainsaw, Halloween, Black Christmas, Friday the 13th, um, Nightmare on Elm Street, um, those were all independent films. And they were picked up by, like, you know, Friday the 13th, yes, Paramount, but they were not made by Paramount. They were picked up by Paramount. Um, indie films, Night of the Living Dead, Another, another case, you know, um, some of the most classic horror films were independently made films. Um, as David Side is not <laughs> a horror classic, that's not what I'm implying. But I, I, I really encourage people to support indie films because their most original ideas come from them. And then the big studios kind of catch up. So, ditto from me. Well, <laughs> Jason Paul Cullum, thank you so much for uh, joining us here on Vital Indie Media. 
And uh, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you will um, take care of yourselves, be safe, uh, be sane, um, only, be a little bit crazy. It's you know, a little bit crazy is okay, but uh, but definitely be safe and uh, be safe and take care of yourselves. And we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks for having here. me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, I would love to know what you thought about that interview. So please leave a comment down below and subscribe for more interviews from Vital Indie Media.